Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your hosts, Jim Person and Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Hello, Knife Junkies. Welcome to episode number 43 of the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Jim Person. And I'm Bob DeMarco. And like you, I have a knife problem. <laughs> Welcome to the show. Okay. What an intro. <laughs> we got to talk about that. What do you mean? What do you mean? Well, I was just, before we started rolling, Jim, I was saying uh, yesterday was National Knife Day. August and, 24th. Yeah, yeah, August 24th. And uh, I, I showed such good discipline in not ordering a knife on National Knife Day that today I just might reward myself uh, for that discipline by ordering a knife. And and I just realized how... Nice justification. Yeah, that's, that's problematic. <laughs> Well, I was uh, I was uh, Googling uh, National Knife Day, and on the Days of the Year uh, site, it says Knife Day is the day to appreciate the knives that folks use on a daily basis. This day is a celebration of this marvelous tool that has been with humans since the dawn of time. And that's kind of what we've been talking about. Uh, you know, the knife is the first tool. That is an amazing definition to round out that holiday, and I think it needs to be quarterly. But, no. but I, I'll take a yearly, I'll take an annual <laughs> knife maybe day we'll, to start. Maybe we'll start the, the knife junkie quarterly something. I don't know. We'll have to think about that. Yeah, we will. Yeah. So uh, you're going to reward yourself with a knife. What is it? Do you know yet? Well, um, it's because I'm on the mailing list of Knife Center and they sent this uh, email two days after my birthday and it, it was uh, a, uh, they, they found in the warehouse <laughs> these uh, <laughs> these uh, older blackjack uh, sort of Randall copy. Uh, Randall made knives are these amazing American made knives. Jim, I think you saw a video about a guy who found a whole bunch of them. Yes, yes. Uh, they're beautiful handmade knives. And uh, I've always wanted one. If you get one from them, custom, you, you're going to wait five years to get it or something like that and spend quite a bit of money. And then if you find them on the secondary market, they do cost a lot of money. Blackjack is uh, a company that was originally owned and run by Mike Stewart, who has uh, who owns and runs Bark River Knives, and everyone knows the quality of Bark River Knives. Anyway, so he was he would make reproductions or copies of um, uh, presumably licensed copies of the Randall made fighter models, and they're beautiful. And uh, but they have Mike Stewart's touches like the uh, convex edge, and uh, just. Incredible construction. So uh, they found uh, there there was one in there with ivory micarta uh, for a lot cheaper than you would buy it if you were to get it new. And uh, so I had to get it. Oh, okay. And right. that's going to come. And I'm going to call that uh, my second birthday knife. Right. <laughs> and I'm sure we'll see a collection selection video on that at some point in time. Indeed. And you're still going strong with those pretty much every day. Well, yeah, they're fun. I, I, I have to uh, I have to kind of represent each one of these before I can cull or do anything. And, you know, uh, that's not going to happen. Too. Right. <laughs> Especially if you keep buying knives, you'll never get through every knife you have. So then you won't have to sell. So the, that's, I see the motive behind your, your plan here, Bob. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's true. It's uh, the moment it gets back in your hands, you're like, well, maybe I should just keep this one. Right. I want to remind you of the Knife Chunky podcast is brought to you by our sponsor, the Get Upside app. It's a great way to save cash uh, on uh, your gas purchases. Actually, you get gas ba uh, cash back. When you buy gas, it's an app. You simply put it on your smartphone. I used it yesterday when I was out and about buying gas. I did a search of the area, found the station, went and bought it, bought gas. Uh, just print the receipt out, take a picture of the receipt with your smartphone, and just like that, you've got cash back into your account. So if you want to get it and start saving some money, go to thenifejunkie.com slash save on gas. That's all one word, thenifejunkie.com slash save on gas. Bob, another interview show today. Who do we have yeah. that you're going to be talking to, and, and what's our what's our main subject matter today? Today I'm speaking with knife maker Tom Krein, who first came on my radar for his stellar blade regrinds. Uh, people would send them knives they want reground. He'd regrind them, and then you'd see his little bulldog logo over the reground portion, which always just looks so cool to me. Anyway, he's been making knives for years now, and uh, they're these beautiful sort of small-scale fixed blades on the whole. Those are the ones I know him for. The one knife that he makes that uh, I would really like to get my hands on is the pocket buoy. It's a little buoy knife that fits in a little leather sheath that fits in your front pocket, and it is gorgeous. And it looks like it would be a cool knife to scale up. Anyway, 
He was a great guy to talk to. It was very interesting to hear about his uh, trajectory and his shop and how his family is involved. And uh, it was just really great to talk to him. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, we're going to hear that. So why don't we do it right now? You're listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you've got questions or comments, call the 24-7 Knife Junkie listener line at 724-466-4487. Tom Crine, thanks for joining me on the Knife Junkie Podcast. Glad to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, it's my pleasure. You're known for your grinds, and uh, I've known you for your, or I guess I first got to know you from your regrinds and seeing people do videos on how exquisitely you reground some sort of big fat knife. But uh, in, in kind of looking you up and looking at your website, you mentioned that you have always been a knife guy. What's, what's that all about? Why, what is it about knives that's always captured you? Man, I, I've been fascinated with knives since I was a little kid. And I think, you know, I think it started just seeing my dad and like my grandpa and my granddad, they all carried knives. Every single one of them always had a knife in their pocket. And, you know, I could see the usefulness of that even at, at a young age. And, um, you know, I don't know. I mean, I've, I've always loved guns and knives. I mean, literally as a little kid before school, I would draw them and, <laughs> uh, my, uh, my mom was pretty disturbed about all that and, uh, kind of forbade me to, to do any of that. But, uh, you know, later on I found out that she went to counseling over it, which is kind of crazy, but, uh, you know, I think it's a healthy thing. You know, it's a, it's tools and, and, you know, uh, it's really uh, one of man's greatest tools, the knife, in my opinion, and it allows you to defend, defend yourself if needed. Um, mm -hmm. I think a firearm is a better choice, but, you know, if you don't have one, you use what you got, right? Um, right. And all knives are tools, all knives are weapons, so it's kind of a neat thing. To me, that's uh, refreshing to hear because oftentimes people kind of ignore the weapon side of things and gravitate towards the more uh, civil, you know, tool aspect of it. And and I, I respect that, uh, you know, one, uh, like 99.8% of the time it's used as a tool, as a daily, uh, yeah. sandwich cutter. Uh, but I, I think to, uh, kind of neglect its role as a weapon, uh, is kind of short sighted. Yeah. Well, you know, our his the history of, uh, knives in general seems to be short sighted, uh, as far as today, you know, with, uh, Instagram and pictures. All that kind of thing. And, you know, if you go back a hundred years, people understood what knives did. You go back 200 years, they understand knives. You go back further, even more so. Well, you're, you're talking to me from Arkansas, right? Correct. Land of the, the Bowie knife. How, how do you pronounce yep. it? Bowie or Bowie? I don't know. There's a lot of controversy there. I think the correct way is Bowie, but I always say Bowie. Um, yeah, I do. Because that's how I grew up. And, you know, once you start hearing something some way, that's how it's always said. But I think it's correctly done Bowie. Bowie. Well, I'm a Yank, and I always kind of thought like, but, 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 but when I say it, I, I always yeah. kind of second guess myself. But I mean, uh, to me, that's uh, the quintessential. Well, it is the quintessential American knife, and it is my favorite uh, blade pattern. Yeah, me too. Well, what is it about the Bowie? As far as the blade shape, or or are you talking uh, historically the weapon? Well, no, about the blade. Like, why why do you love it so much? Um, so I love, I love the buoy, uh, shape, uh, simply because, um, you can scale it up or down and, and it scaled up to its full size. It's, it's a weapon, a close quarter weapon and, and field tool. I mean, there's nothing close to it as far as utility or versatility. And if you've, if you, do you know who James Keating is? Yes. The, the, uh, the Bowie knife fighter, yeah, Marshall, he's yeah. the long bell fighter. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he did the Crusada and some other stuff, but he, he had a series of DVDs, still does, and you can still buy them. Um, and it's unlocking the secrets of the Bowie knife. And, uh, uh, that, that sharpened swedge is, uh, when you understand it, it's a formidable, uh, tool in close quarters. The back but, cut. Yep. That's it. That's the secret. And, and even if it's not, uh, fully sharpened, uh, just the gouging tip with a back cut is, uh, is something to consider, I think. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, there, those, I, I highly recommend Keating's work. I worked with him for quite a while and, uh, oh. you know, it, really neat stuff. But the cool thing to me is when you scale it down, you know, for me, what I use daily, um, what I use knives for usually is, uh, utility stuff. And, uh, oh. I find that 
the Bowie scaled down like my TK4 mini Bowie or my pocket Bowie, there's plenty of belly to do all your daily chores, but there's enough point that if you need to you know, dig a splinter out or, uh, which is a common occurrence in my household, uh, <laughs> you know, or whatever you need. If you need to clean a trout, say you can, uh, there's plenty of tip to get that job done. Uh, we were talking just before, uh, I hit the, the roll button that I love your pocket Bowie. I think that's the model, uh, yeah, the with, the, one. with the, with the jigged, uh, bone handle. It's just, yeah. it's just so beautiful. And the size, uh, when you see it, I've never held it myself, but when you see it in someone's hand, you realize just how small it is. But uh, the shape, it's formidable. Thanks. I think I'm best known for my small fixed blades. You know, I, I like to make knives that are easily carried because if you don't carry them, you don't mm. get to use them. And it doesn't really take much of a blade to get a lot done. And I, I try to make the biggest small knives you'll ever have. And you mentioned jig bone, and jig bone is a, a super traditional handle material, and I think it fits these smaller knives really well, and it's very classic, and um, it's a good material. It's beautiful, and, you know, it's relatively inexpensive. Yeah, it's got that warm and traditional. I, I can't help but get nostalgic when I see that material. I just think of, you know, my grandfather yep. and uh, times I, I never lived in. So you mentioned James Keating and that you worked with him. What What capacity did you work with James Keating? I first met James Keating when I worked for Bob Dozier. So I worked, I worked for Bob for about three and a half years. And basically at that time, Bob was building the Crusadas for James Keating. Tell, tell us what a Crusada is. So a Crusada is a, a knife that James Keating designed. It's a, a pretty large fighting knife. It's about 14 to 16 inches overall. Um, it's, it's a big piece and it's designed as a fighter. It has. Um, a Spanish notch. It has the, the the quillions. It has the horns. So it's it's a interesting design from James Keating. And then you know Bob decided to stop making them. And then I ended up not working for Bob for a while. And then I worked for A. G. Russell for quite a while, a couple years. Um, and then when I went out on my own, um, we kind of reconnected. And he was looking for someone to build the Crusadas. And so um, I started uh, building the Crusadas. And I. I, it just kind of was one of those things that worked out. And one of the things I, I never liked about the Crusada was the handle shape because it didn't used to have the bird's head pommel. And I asked James, I, I'm like, would it be okay if I redesigned the handle on this? Because, uh, you know, it always feels like it's it's weight forward and it's getting, wanting to shoot out of my hand. And so Was it a coffin-shaped handle? No, it wasn't really coffin-shaped. It, it just didn't have any bird's beak. So, okay. um, you know, on a knife that big, when you're moving it fast, it, it it really did want to squirt out of your hand. So <laughs> I redesigned that. And then, uh, we made quite a few of the dagger blades and then, you know, he had the the videos on the Bowie and I was like, you know, I think I could design a Bowie blade that would work and balance the same as the other blade. And so we did that. And, uh, yeah, we made a bunch of those back in the day. I made trainers for them and, uh, yeah. Wow. So, so as you mentioned before, you're known for your small fixed blade knives, but, uh, so you have a, a past in making these really giant fighting Bowie knives. That's, that's, uh, an interesting, uh, contrast. Yeah. And, and I still make big knives, you know, I mean, just not as many of them. Um, uh, right now we've got, I just finished a few Makos, which are about a four inch fighter. And I've got some TK nine Bowies, which are about a six inch blade in the works, but yeah, mostly I gravitate to about a three or less inch blade because it seems easier for me to, to make and sell and people to actually use. Something that you're going to have on you. Uh, something I saw in one of your videos is your um, sheathing system. You know, it's sort of that, uh, you know, the, the pull cord uh, in the waistband uh, style carry, but with the leather sheath, which I thought was so cool because I've done that myself, just kind of... Uh, not with sheaths that were uh, purpose built for that, but uh, you know, you just kind of like, why can't I just kind of tether it at the bottom and just kind of stick it? And 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 I love that. I love the thought of concealed carry, but with leather, kind of yeah. going back back to basics a little bit. Well, and I mean that'll work with Kydex. It'll work with leather. Um, we do tech locks. We do uh, the Mummert clip is really good. I really What's like that. that. Um, Mark Mummert is a, a knife maker, um, and he makes a clip and it's basically a titanium clip that will, uh, fit tech lock spacing. So we make a okay. leather sheath with holes in it that those fit on. So you can drop a small fixed blade right in your front pocket. Oh, that's cool. Um, 
We use the ulti clips for another option. That's another good option. Really, we try to we try to have a lot of different options for carry because not every carry method works for everyone. Like the TK1 and the Cayenne and the Pocket Bowie, they're small enough that with the right sheath, they'll drop right in your pocket and right. you won't notice them. That's actually a mode of carry that has been more and more interesting to me uh, recently. It's just something that's just small enough, and 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 I don't have I don't wear giant pants with huge capacious pockets, right. but still, like I I want sometimes I just want a fixed blade, and I will frequently carry it in the small of my back, you know, kind of tucked in in my waistband. But in the summertime, it's kind of harder to get away with that, and I just don't feel like having that in there. So to have a fixed blade in my front pocket in some sort of sweet little leather thing that mimics the shape of my of of the pocket itself is, is kind of a, something I've been thinking about. Yeah, a couple things. So um, one thing I found in the front pocket, if you just do like a fold-over sheath and drop it in your pocket, it does the same thing as like a, a folder that you drop in your pocket. A lot oh. of times it just goes sideways at the bottom and it's just super uncomfortable. Yeah. So we, we started making pocket sheaths that are like rectangular, so they drop in and it's got a bottom that kind of, uh, hits bottom and doesn't tip. But, right, uh, right. what I really like to do with the, like the TK1 or the Cayenne is pair it with a AAA flashlight. So you've got a light and a knife mm -hmm. and that extra width actually makes it carry better because it doesn't fall over. Right. But it has a purpose and yeah. you, know, you got your light in there. Yeah. And I got, I got inspiration from that from a, a couple of holster makers in the past that I've worked with that did stuff for magazines, spare mags and, and guns and stuff like that. So, uh, some of that was, you know, I adapted it to the knife industry, but it, no, by no means was it my my uh, invention or idea to start with. So, so with your knives themselves, what is your de design philosophy? I know that that um, for you, uh, function always follow. Um, yeah, form always follows function. Yeah. Uh, but but uh, give me your design philosophy. What are you looking to make? So, uh, you know, the way I design knives is. Probably a lot similar to some people. It's different than others. I mean, it's, we're all different. Um, it's much different than, uh, a few of my close friends like, uh, Lucas Burnley and Ken Onion. They, when they go to design something, they, they imagine like a room or whatever in Mars or whatever and they start designing that way. Um, I've tried that. I can't do it. I, I do it a different way. Basically, I imagine myself doing whatever I am wanting to do, like say I'm making a hunting knife. I'm like, I start imagining what I'm doing and how, how I use it, how it fits my hand. And, and that's kind of, my designs are pretty purpose driven. You know, I, if I sit down and I'm doing design work, I'm like, well, I kind of want a Persian style fighter with, you know, that I can carry, say a three and a half inch blade. That's a knife that I recently have been working towards. Mm. And I'll, and I'll just kind of look at historical knives um, for inspiration, um, and then think about what I'm asking of it and where, how I'm going to carry it. And then another important thing that a lot of guys don't think of is what, how can, how can I make this? Will my tools, what will my tools allow me to do? Cause I have to work designs around my tools because if I can't make it, it doesn't matter how awesome the design is. So very purpose driven when I sit down and design. And I think my knives show that they're not, they're not flashy. They're not, I think they have nice lines, but they're simple lines, you know, and they're and hopefully when you see them, you can look at it and say, hey, I totally understand this. And when you pick it up, you're like, oh, yeah, this works to the eye. Elegant. Yes. Um, elegant lines, but purpose driven. Uh, definitely. And and um, so I want to ask you about your grinding and your and how you sure. got started. And I heard of you first from your regrinds. But before we get to that, I want to say, you know, you're known for your blades for sure. But. I also kind of know you, I can identify one of your knives from the handles for sure. And they, um, Thanks. you know, we, we keep talking about, yeah, sure. We, we keep talking about the, uh, the, the pocket Bowie, like that handle to me is not only looks comfortable, just kind of intuitively, but it also looks like a, a, a shrunken down version of the kind of, uh, big sort of, uh, handle I like on a big Bowie, you know, with the two big swoops and the, and, uh, and the flared out pommel and everything. It, oh yeah. Yeah. For sure. If you look at the, the Crusada, uh, you know, the, the later Crusadas that we, we were building, um, you can see the inspiration for those handles. Cause I, I do several different handles like that. But, uh, as far as grinding, you know, regrinds are kind of interesting. You know, when I, when I started to do that, I had no, 
mean, there was no nobody that I knew of that was doing regrinds. As far as I know, I was the first person. Um, and it, the way that came about was kind of funny because, you know, back in the day we had forums and that was about it. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was on Blade forums. Uh, that was before I was on USN. So that's that's been a long time ago, mm-hmm. you know. Do you remember Cliff Stamp? I remember the name, but I so he he was on Blade Forums, and he's a, he's a controversial character. Um, I I actually really like Cliff, love him or hate him, either way it doesn't matter. But uh, he he was always pushing the edge on performance, and uh, he posted in the group he had a I want to say the first knife I ever reground was a Falk knife and blade, and he he was like, hey, I, I'm looking for someone to grind this. I want it, and he had these specs, and I think it was like five thousandths behind the edge, <laughs> and then at at so far up, he wanted it at, you know, 7,000. So, you know, he had all these specs. Right. And everybody was saying, I can't be done, can't be done. And I, and, and I got on there and, you know, back in the day, uh, it was funny that the, the guys on there that were all like the people that laid down the law of what could and couldn't be done. It was like, it was kind of funny because they would be like, it can't be done. But they'd talk about how they ground a blade, took all day to grind a blade. And it's like, uh, that's kind of crazy. But um <laughs> Because I was working for Dozier at the time, or I had already worked for Dozier, I don't know. Um, and I and I told Cliff I'd do it, and that was the first regrind. And uh, you know, I didn't have a term for it. You know, it was just a grind. And then, you know, when when people started asking for it, we we developed something called a regrind. And then, you know, this was back when the Spider Code Delica and Spider Code Endura they were all really thick saber grinds. None right, of them were right. full flat because nobody wanted that. You know, uh, back in the day. Yeah. And so we did a lot. I did a lot of grinds on those. And that's how kind of how that came about. And, you know, I think people are starting to wake up as far as it's interesting in the knife industry, you know, people sell steel, right? And and I think there's a lot of um, maybe ignorance isn't the right word, but a lot of uh, misconceptions mm-hmm. because uh, steel is a quantifiable item. You know, if this has 3V steel, I mean, 3V steel is good, period, all day long, right? Well, maybe. There's, there's more that goes into performance than just the steel mm-hmm. because it goes, comes down to heat treat and then geometry. And I think geometry is probably the most important thing as far as performance for cutting. And a lot of these knives from the factories just were really thick and they didn't perform well because of the geometry was wrong. And so it turned out crazy. I had to stop for a while because it literally, it took over everything I was doing. Well, the game at the time was not about building a cutting tool necessarily correct yeah yeah not it would yeah and and companies can't really make knives as thin you know for the general public this is all about numbers game right so this is what what will sell to the general public and they won't get it back but if you're a knife fanatic or uh, enthusiast and you know how to use a knife uh, a thinner knife it doesn't need to be overbuilt and it will and as long as you're not prying with it, it'll cut so much better. It's it's ridiculous. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's much easier to take care of because there's like literally 20% of the steel to sharpen when you go to sharpen it. Right. And uh, yeah, it's all about p- performance. So what what would you say are the hallmarks of your blades? Like what what, what is the thing that defines your, ni- your knives? Well, my, my custom knives, you know, I think... I, I like to grind my knives thin. My knives are not made to be impact tools. Uh, a few specific knives are, but for the most part, I grind my knives very thin because in the field, if you need to sharpen them, a thick knife is really hard to sharpen. And, and also a thin knife with the right geometry will, will cut really well. I mean, it, it will cut, it will surprise you how, how well they will cut. And and actually, that cutting performance can make up for brute strength, I, I think. Oh, yeah. And and, that, and that's just in my own noodling around. Yeah, and I mean, and, and it's interesting. I mean, in this industry, I think you should have an open mind. You know, uh, when I started, um, to me, intuitively, the Scandi grind was worthless. Hmm. Uh, it, it just was. Do you still I mean, feel look, that way? Oh no, no, not at all. It's it's funny. I I bought a Mora. I was like, everybody was talking about this, and and I do a lot of woods type stuff. And I was like, well, I'm, you know, I like to put my money where my mouth is. I'm going to try stuff, before, you know, and I, I had my own opinions, but my opinions, if I have never tried a knife, it's not backed by fact. So I bought one and I tried it and I was like, um, and I, and I did a lot of wood carving at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, I still do some, but, uh, I was blown away by <laughs> what it did on wood. I was like, what? 
<laughs> I, I'm like, how does this work? It can't work. I, I didn't understand it. And now I do because, you know, a zero grind, there's no secondary edge. And so for wood and for self-defense, there's, there's certain applications where there's nothing that will do as good as a Scandi or zero grind. You know, it, once again, it's application driven. Um, it, it is counterintuitively a more, a more delicate edge than anything else I do. So, uh, because the angle is, you know, it's 25 degree angle. It's 12 and a half degrees on each side, you know, 25 inclusive. Whereas when we normally sharpen, we're out at 30 plus it's thicker immediately behind that. Right. Right. So the Scandi grind is, it's a, it's a really neat thing. And for like defensive knives where you're not going to be abusing them, it's, it's very purpose driven, man, they cut great chisel grinds. Same thing. I'm not a super yes. big fan of chisel grinds for you know, utility use or whatever, but for self-defense, guess what? Right. Once again, they're narrow, they're thin. Yeah, they, they track oddly through materials if you're just using them. Uh, you yeah, know. but if you're just sticking in somebody, but, who but, cares? But yeah, yeah. And if you're, and if you're actually cutting someone, it actually, uh, does a lot. You know, if, if you care, it makes the wound worse. You know what I'm yeah. saying? Yeah, yeah. Uh, cause it, it has different pull on either side. Even besides that, it's so much thinner. I mean, once again, you're, yeah. You know, edge geometry goes into it and it's really, it's bizarre. The things that y you preconceive may not actually be true. And, you know, would I want to use a chisel grind for everyday cutting purposes? Probably not. Would it work? Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah. So, uh, what about a convex grind? So convex grind has to me a few specific applications as far as what I do. I don't do a lot of them. Mm -hmm. I, Feel that if you do an axe, an axe always needs to be convex. Um, one for strength and two, um, any other blade grind will stick in wood. Uh, it just mm. doesn't really work well. Um, in because my there's experience. too much surface area touching at the same time. I, I don't know what it is. A convex grind is just what, what works well on an axe and stuff like that. But, yes. uh, I do a convex grind on a couple big choppers. I think that's a good place for convex grind because you really need that thicker edge for strength. Mm -hmm. Um, and I do a couple hunting axes that I do that and they're not very big, but they're designed to skin, choke up and skin with. And, you know, this is something I, d I do not recommend any of my knives go through pelvis or any of that stuff. Can you do mm -hmm. it? Sure. Odds are you're going to knock a, a big chunk out of the edge. Cause I like my knives hard and thin and mm -hmm. they're not designed for that. But if you want to do that, you something one of else. My, What's that? Yeah, well, I one of my use axes. something else for that part. Yeah, yeah, use or, an axe. Or a saw. I think a saw, a saw is what I personally use. Um, it's mm -hmm. one of a Gerber saw with a, the bone blade. It works really great on the pelvis and opens things up and there's not little splinters and nasty stuff that will cut you. So l l let me backtrack and ask you, yeah, sure. how did your knife career begin? Uh, you're, you're a, a knife maker. How did it begin? So in high school, um, I got Sid Latham's book, uh, Knives and Knife Makers, great book, out of print for a long time. Um, and I, I was, and I was also introduced to Blade Cut, Blade Magazine, um, my sophomore year. And I was like, you know, this is really cool. I want to do this. Mm -hmm. Um, my parents had a different idea. They, I was destined for med school and that's where they pushed me. So I went to college, uh, was pre med. I took nursing to get, uh, into the medical field and start, uh, my career so I could work my way through and stuff. And I decided that, you know, this really wasn't for me. I, I didn't want to do medicine. Um, and I, I was out on my own and I just kind of got the nerve to tell my parents no, basically. And, uh, I think I was a disappointment to my dad the whole time just for that. You know, I think he was proud of what I was able to become and build, but as far as, you know, he always thought I should have been a doctor, but, uh, so long story short, I went to nursing school, um, started working as a nurse because I needed, you know, to make money. And that's really a, about all I had. And I, when we moved back home a couple of years after that, uh, to Arkansas, I went to school in Tennessee. Mm -hmm. Um, I got a house with a garage and I was like, I'm going to make some knives, you know, and I, this is something that I always wanted to do. And back then we had like Covals and chef fields and, uh, Texas got a knife supply oh. and some other places like that. And I bought a bunch of supplies and I started to make knives, you know, and they were really crappy and it was really hard because there was no internet then. This was 27 <laughs> years ago, 26 years ago. And, uh, where I live, you know, AG Russell knives is literally 30 minutes away oh, or less. Cool. 
And uh, so I made some knives. I got the Bob Loveless book on knives and the David Bowie book on how to make knives. And uh, I, my first one, I took it over to A.G. Russell. Couldn't have been more proud. And he's like, uh, yeah, it needs some work. And he gave me some <laughs> pointers. And uh, that happened back and forth. I, I would build a knife and take it over there and show him. And we okay. kind of developed a relationship. I mean, that's I, I can't imagine something more valuable than that as a as a young, you know, knife artist coming up. You need someone to critique your work, especially a master. Yeah, and he was honest and, and he was also encouraging. And, you know, uh, in that book that I mentioned, Knives and Knife Makers, Bob Dozier uh, is featured in that quite a bit. He does the how-to build in there and his knives are all through it. And, you know, Bob was from Louisiana, but... Um, Come to find out, he had started working for A.G. Russell, and he was actually 30 minutes away, too. And so, I built like 13 knives, and then A.G. was like, hey, you know, Bob's looking for help. And I was working as a nurse at the time, but we didn't have any kids, and my wife is also a nurse. And, you know, uh, I actually asked and got permission to go apply for this. And so, uh, my wife has always been super supportive. So and cool. uh you know, basically, I went from a, a good paying nursing job to working for Bob. And Bob was was like, I am not going to teach you how to make knives, period. <laughs> <laughs> but he couldn't get good help. And um, I'm one of those guys that uh, I'm gonna, if, if I got to be there at 8, I'm going to be there at 5 till 8 probably. And I'll show up and uh, be there. You can count on me and I'm going to work. I'm This is what I want to do. And uh, so, he put me to building – grinders because they did the dozer grinder at the time and cleaning the shop hmm. and somebody wouldn't show up and he'd be like, Hey, I need you over here. And so he'd teach me something. And I'd do that until I got them two or three weeks caught up. And then he put me back on grinders. And by the end of the first year, I'd gone through every single stage and wow. could do everything in the shop. And I had the keys of the shop and Bob might show up and he might not show up. And, oh, and I was yeah. basically he made me a supervisor of the shop. And so I ran the shop for about three and a half years. What an education. My God. That's yeah, like it was, uh, apprenticing under a master, basically. Well, it was, it was basically getting paid to go to school. And, and you know, I, I joked the first year, Bob paid me $6 an hour for the whole first year. <laughs> I showed up for, well, I did get a raise. He started me at $5 and 50 cents, but $6 an hour for the first year. And, I, and you know, I, I didn't need the money and this is what I was wanting to do and was passionate about. And, mm -hmm. Uh, you know, I, I bought in a hundred percent. You obviously got something way more valuable out of it than the money. Oh yeah, man. It was like literally getting paid to go to knife school. <sighs> yeah. So. I guess something a lot of us, uh, maybe people who are listening probably dream of in one way or another. It was just like everything lined up, you know, it was, it was a, it was a very fortunate thing. So what's your shop like today? Your own shop. My shop now, so it's interesting. We've, we've changed quite a bit in the last year or so. Um, I've, I've had the building that I am at right now for probably 10 or 12 years. And the back two thirds of it has always been unfinished. Um, but about a year ago, we, two years ago, we started, uh, I started needing more space. And so we started finishing the back. We put a new roof on, uh, we insulated, we dropped another 200 amp panel. Uh, for electricity and basically, um, up until that point, my shop was about 900 square feet, which it, it was a pretty nice shop, um, set up for one guy, but, um, my kids had started working with me. Um, so <laughs> cool. they worked their way through high school. So my, my oldest son is in co almost to finish college. My middle son went to college last year, but he's decided not to go to college again this year. And he's actually going to be staying at home and working in the shop. And then my youngest son, who's a sophomore, is starting to work this year. So, um, we, we've wow. always had a few people. And then a couple, two years ago, I hired a, a full time employee. Um, and then about, well, that was probably three years ago. And then two years ago, I hired another one. So I've got an office manager, um, who does shipping and also runs all the scenes. We've got a CNC mill now, which is kind of nice. crazy. He does all the CNC stuff and he's a, he's a, a good knife maker on his own right. This year we'll have three full time employees other than myself plus a part time employee. Wow. So how many, uh, so everything that comes out of your shop, uh, goes through your hands. How, how long does, the, how much do you put out? So right now, um, 
it's it's kind of interesting. We're averaging about 30, 25 to 30 knives a week. Wow. And right now I do everything from glue on, glue up, out, basically. So I'm doing all the grinding. I'm doing all the handwork. I'm doing a lot of stuff. And and there's really no reason for me to do that. You know, I, that's the stuff I did when, for Dozier. And, and I'm it, it's on me a little bit just because I haven't trained my employees to where I need to. And so I've, I've started doing some training because, you know, if we put our logo on it, the quality's there, that's going to be always how it works. Right. And that's the final say, but, uh, I I've actually started training my sons, um, to do some different stuff. So my youngest son, Zach, and then my middle son, Ben, and then Jake, this summer, they all wanted to build knives. And I'm like, perfect. Because, <laughs> you know, I mean, they, to make some money and, and you know, uh, they still work in the shop when I need them to do whatever, but then they have some knives they're working on. And well, it's nice for them to actually want to do it, not for you to oh, have to, like, make them do it. No, no. Yeah, this is all on them. That's and cool. uh, it allowed me to start teaching some different stuff. So they've done, you know, 90% of the work on these knives when they're like, I can't get this. Like I'm teaching them to scandy grind, and uh, so they're the plunges are hard to to learn. But uh, after five or six knives, they got it. You know they're they're scandy grinding as good as I am, and this is all freehand. I say freehand. There's a rest with scandy grinding. There has to kind of be a rest mm -hmm. uh, the way I do it because um, it's twelve and a half degrees, and it's really hard to be super accurate with that without a rest. But you still are freehanding it against the rest and it's it's easy to mess it up sure. if you're not paying attention so they're all up to speed on that at this point so they can all do scandy grinds as well as i can all right let me ask you this so um you know artistic skill runs through families uh mm -hmm. what do you think do you think uh you've passed some talent along to your sons so i don't you know i don't know about talent i think they're all extremely talented i think most of the stuff we learn are, do is is learned, can be learned. You know, as far as design work, you have to be passionate. But, um, when I started, man, my drawings of knives sucked mm -hmm. and it's something that I've worked at. And, and as you make them, you learn how to design. Um, if you, if anyone saw my early design stuff, they'd laugh, you know, mm. but you learn scale, you learn curves, you learn what works and what doesn't work. And, um, they're actually learning that they've all done designs this summer and they're good. I've, help them fine tune them a little bit because of, uh, what works with our tools. Um, and, uh, yeah, I think they're going to be good. We're going to have some of those up for sale, uh, before long. And what's cool is, uh, we modified our logo. So instead of it saying crying and the year, which is with the bulldog in the middle, which is my mm -hmm. logo, Ben's knives say B crying, Jake's or J crying and Zach's or Z right. crying. So oh, that's so cool. Pretty cool. Yeah. Take ownership of what they're doing. Yeah. So, so that is a collaboration in a in a um, in a micro sense. You've done some collaborations on a macro sense. I know you had a, a pocket bow, yeah, and something else. I can't remember the name with Boker. You probably had more that I I don't know of. But um, something I've brought up with with people I've been speaking with recently is this: uh, these super high end companies churning out high fidelity reproductions of custom knives or just production knives on a, on a really, uh, you know, high end scale. And to me, the one thing that separates that from what you are doing is, well, the handwork for sure. I mean, what you're doing is so hands on, but what some other makers are doing also is just the custom spirit. There's like actual spirit that goes into it from the artist because you're spending time with that piece of work. Uh, it's not just rolling a along a, a factory belt line, even though it's coming out perfect at the end, it, there's something that's missing from it. What is it like for you to collaborate, uh, whether it's with your sons or with a, with a company like Boker? You know, I, every, every different collaboration, every collaboration is different. How about that? You know, uh, working with Boker and like Columbia river knife and tool, great, great experiences. Um, I've, I've worked with both of them quite a bit. Um, great companies. I, I love seeing what the companies are able to do right now. They're, they're pushing the limits hard right now and it's pretty neat. I love that they're collaborating with custom makers. You know, factory knives, uh, 
they're tools, you know. I mean, I, I, I love knives, period. If you, if you were in my office, I could show you I've got literally everything from $5 factory knives to, you know, high end customs. And I, I don't know. I, I just love knives, you know, if, whether it's a Swiss Army knife or whatever. They're, they're useful. I carry them. I agree to a point as far as there being something special about a custom knife. Um, and even when they're not perfect, you know, I mean, Randall knives, for instance, I love the, I love them. I, I don't know why. I, I just do. You know, historically, there's a great story behind it. Yes. Um, there's, there's still a lot of craftsmanship. Are they perfect? No, but they're, they're perfectly good the way they are. They're, they're a perfect tool. It's that Japanese concept of the, the beauty and imperfection, you know, like, uh, yeah. uh Japanese, uh, um, ceramicists will, will build imperfection into their work for, for the yeah. beauty of it, you know? And, and my knives aren't perfect either. I, I'm sure there's a lot of custom makers that look at my knives and they're like, man, you, you need to work on your finish because I build a knife to work, you know, and that's kind of where I came from with my background with Bob Dozier, um, and Dozier knives. I, I finished mine differently than Bob, but very similar. If you look at my knives and you look at Dozier's knives, you can definitely see the heritage and Bob builds a great knife. I mean, they're, they're hardcore working knives. He's, he's made a name for himself building those kind of knives and that's not all he's ever built or all he still builds, but you know, those $300 hardcore hunting knives and, mm. and outdoor knives are where he's made his lunch, you know, I mean, that's his bread and butter. And, uh, a lot of respect for Bob and the knives that he built because really there wasn't a lot of people building that kind of a knife when he started. Everybody was building the the high polished mirror mirror polish with the guards and all that, and Bob was too. What advice uh, would you give? Well, you know, I'm not going to ask it that way. I'm going to say it seems to me, uh, you know, I I've been uh, into knives since uh, you know I was a kid in the 70s, and uh, I've seen. Uh, the knife world, especially in the last uh, 10 years, 11 years, since I first saw Nothing Fancy and my eyes were open to uh, social media and knives, I've seen uh, the knife world expand, you know, hugely. And mm -hmm. it seems like you see a lot of new people all the time making beautiful stuff uh, after not too long of hacking it, hacking it out. Uh, do you have any advice or, or, or would you have any any recommendations for a way to go about it to some of these uh, younger companies? Younger companies or younger no, I makers? guess young, younger makers. I, I think it's I think it's an interesting time right now. Um, you know, when I started, it was it was early '90s, and internet really wasn't out there, um, and I for sure didn't have access to it for quite a while. But you know, there was books, and um, I still think there's a lot of value in books, but it. Really, it, it depends on how you learn, right? So some people can read a book and learn. I'm one of those people. Some people have to watch something and some people need to be hands on. I think everybody could do, do with hands on. And, yeah. you know, there's so much information on the internet. Just be careful where you're getting it because some of these guys, maybe you shouldn't be paying attention to what they're doing. But, uh, if you can find someone in your area, if you're, if you're wanting to start making knives, that's a great way to get some hands on. And that's, you know, uh, I've helped several people and it's, uh, it's, it's good to give back. And so things have also changed in the industry back when I started, nobody was going to show you anything right <laughs> now with the, with the forums and, and, and the internet, it's almost like that's all changed because it's like, you know, we used to do work, you know, the whip builds and, uh -huh, and different yes. stuff like that on the forums. And it just opened everything up because there's really no secrets anymore. So now there's no point to not sharing. Right. It, it, it automatically separates the wheat from the chaff because everyone's got the same information. So yeah, I think, I think there's a lot of, uh, good in books and, and any information. Uh, I, I'm of the, I'm of the, uh, mindset to read or watch anything and take what I can use and go from there. You know, there's usually something I can take, even if it's not to do it that way. Yes. Yes. So, uh, what, what is the future of crying knives? Future? Man, I don't know, man. We're, we're going to keep doing what we do. Uh, hopefully, um, we're having fun, uh, building knives and, uh, you know, who knows, maybe, maybe the kids will decide they want to 
make knives, but at the end of the day, this is my dream, not their dream. They have to follow their dreams. So, you know, we're going to do, hopefully we're going to be doing this for a while. You know, we never know what tomorrow brings, but, uh, uh, if I have any say in it, I'll be, I'll be making knives for quite a while. I, I it's what I, I'm passionate about and I love building functional tools. And well, how can, uh, how can people find you? How can people find your knives and get in touch with you? So, you know, I have a Facebook group that crying knives group. Um, that's really where I'm most active. I'm in there daily. Um, I try to do a morning post, uh, kind of showing what's in progress in the shop and, you know, what I'm listening to. We do a lot of, you know, Hey, what are you reading type stuff? And uh, we have a good time in there. It's a, it's a pretty good group of guys. Um, I'm on Instagram. I, Instagram is a tough one for me. Mm -hmm. uh, I just, it's a hard place to do business. It's a great place to put pictures and, uh, so, uh, my son, Ben, um, is a really great photographer and, uh, he's going to be here all, all year is what the plan is. And we're actually starting to figure out what he's going to do. And I think I'm going to put him on my Instagram. Yeah. So yeah, it's more intuitive for him. And, uh, really we could get, we should be taking pictures, a lot more pictures and putting them up and we just haven't. So, uh, if I can, I think that's going to be part of his daily job. And so it just makes sense as a good fit. So we're on Instagram. We're on Facebook. Um, you can email me at crying knives, uh, or you can go to my website, crying knives.net and find all the contact information. Well, as, as a serial procrastinator myself, I, I would say, uh, yeah, I think it's really smart for you to have your young son take over the, the Instagram side <laughs> right? of things and get all visual. <laughs> Cause you know, at work when I'm, uploading or downloading or rendering or whatever I'm doing and I'm sitting waiting for a machine, what do I do? Let's look at knives, you know? So I look at, I look at yeah. all the knives on Instagram. Um, the other thing I was going to say is, uh, I guess a shout out to your Facebook group because, uh, one of the videos I was watching of, uh, one of your collectors, someone who collects your knives scored the most beautiful, um, well, the knife I was telling you before about the Bowie oh, yeah. with the, with the, um, bone handle. And he got that on your Facebook group and he was one of three. So, uh, yeah, if you're looking to get a Tom Crine knife, I, it seems like the Facebook group is the way to go. It really is. Well, Tom Crine, it was a pleasure having you on the Knife Junkie podcast. Thank you so much for coming on. And, uh, I think I speak for many of us when I say I look forward to see, uh, what's coming up next from you. So thanks, thanks for Bob. coming on. Yeah. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Subscribe to the Knife Junkies YouTube channel at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. We're back on the Knife Junkie podcast. Jim Person along with Bob, the Knife Junkie, DeMarco, another uh, great interview. Tom Crime there. And just uh, throw this out there. If you want to uh, help support the Knife Junkie podcast uh, and you're in the market to buy a knife, either off Amazon or off eBay, go to thenifejunkie.com slash shop Amazon or thenifejunkie.com slash shop eBay. You'll pay the same price you normally would, but we get a small commission, and it helps uh, pay our bills here at the Knife Junkie Podcast. So, Bob, interview with Tom, pretty uh, pretty cool guy. Yeah, yeah, indeed. Uh, it's it's always great to get to know a little bit, get to know someone whose work I really admire. And uh, it was um, interesting to see that he had some serious mentors, and and, and that definitely shows in his work. Mm. Um, but I, I love the fact that... Uh, well, I love when people aren't squeamish about uh, approaching knives as weapons. But what I thought was interesting is he, he's he's a man from Arkansas, just like Jim Bowie. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Bowie knife, at least anyway, hails from Arkansas. And he's got a, a serious affinity for it. And uh, I just kind of think it brings everything full circle. It's kind of cool. So what did you think about today's interview? Give us a call on the listener line and let us know your favorite part. Uh, maybe you got a question that came out of it. Anyway, call the listener line, 724-466-4487, 724-466-4487. Leave us a question or a comment or uh, something that uh, we could uh, play here on the podcast. We'd love to hear from you. Bob, final thought as we wrap up episode number 43 of the Knife Chunky Podcast. Well, uh, we just celebrated, as we mentioned, National Knife Day, but remember... Every day is National Every Knife Day. Day. That's right. Every day is Knife Day. For Bob, the Knife Junkie DeMarco, I'm Jim Person. I want to thank you truly for listening to the Knife Junkie podcast. Without you, this wouldn't be possible. So we say thanks for listening. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. 
For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487 and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Podcast.